give you, I guess, updates when we find out, but that was just told to me, so I, f I felt it necessary to pray for the individual in that situation. Um, oh, yeah, okay, okay, thank you. It's our sister, uh, Camille Cooper. Um, so let's just continue to keep her, her family, and uh, our home in prayer. Um, all right, um, so we're going to jump into uh, the message. And um, before I do, just have two quick announcements. The first one is um, after this service, for about 10 minutes or so, I'd like the men to stay behind um, to meet uh, about some things. So just the men, if you could stay behind for maybe 5, 10 minutes, no more, um, we can uh, discuss some things. Um, and then also, today's Care Sunday. Uh, so we're very thankful for the small groups that we have here in this ministry. It's the lifeblood of the church. Um, and I encourage us all to, to get plugged in uh, to a care group if we're not already. Um, today I'd like to talk about seasons of change. Seasons of change. Um, we all have to go through changes in our lives. And everybody's change looks different. Some people's change looks similar. Um, we have to realize how we change and grow with the seasons of change that come in our lives. Uh, some things will stay the same when things switch up, when those seasons change, and other things will change along with the seasons, depending on what it is that we go through, depending on what it is that we go through. Um, many of you know I, I, I did missions work with an organization called YWAM, Youth with a Mission, and we traveled out to Asia. And um, it was interesting because they had this term when they were trying to sell you something. Let's say you wanted uh, something that was, you know, like a, a, a watch in a specific color, a specific brand. And they'd have a watch that looked similar, but it wasn't quite the same, had a different knob here or a different uh, uh, feature here. Um, but it wasn't exactly the same one you wanted, but it was, you know, kind of in the same vein, you know. Um, they'd have this phrase called same, same, but different. And so you'd be like, oh, I want this watch. And they'd be like, oh, but we have, we have this one here. And they'd be like, oh, but it's not really the same. They'd say, oh, same, same, but different, but different. And they try to, you know, continue to get it, to sell it to you. And it kind of makes sense because it's similar, but it's, it's different. And the seasons of change in our lives uh, are very different, but there can be some similarities that are woven throughout uh, those seasons of change. Amen? Um, and so in transition, in transition, like we're, we're going through now as a church, if there's one thing we can count on, it's that there's going to be change. In transition in our lives, when we transition from one season to another, from one place to a next, from one location, one job uh, to a next, uh, there's going to be change. That's a given. The question that remains is, what are the changes going to be? Um, when are they going to occur? And what does that mean for me? And also, what things are going to remain the same? The answer to these questions vary from situation, from businesses to companies to countries to churches. But to get a better grasp on this, I think we should take a look at one of the most famous transitions in the history of, of, of transitions, and this is the change from leadership from Moses to Joshua. From Moses to Joshua. I'm coming from the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. Joshua 1, 5 and 6. <clears throat> I'm just going to pray. Dear God, I thank you so much for your people. Lord, I thank you for this word that you've given me to speak. I pray, Lord, that you would be seen, heard, and felt, and you would do what only you can do in the lives of your people, that you would meet their needs, Father, um, through this word, God, that it would be a, a timely word for each person present. Um, I thank you for uh, even our members that are not here, that are going through situations and seasons, and I pray that you would help them to know that you are with them, that you are their peace, you are their strength in the midst of their storm and in the midst of what they're going through, Father. So I thank you and praise you uh, for your protection, for your safety. I thank you and praise you for uh, who you are to each of us, Father. I thank you for the soil uh, that's on the hearts of each person, and I pray that this seed uh, would fall on good ground, Lord. I thank you and praise you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Okay, so I'm coming from the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. You guys have it? Yes, yes okay. Uh, start reading. Uh, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Now, there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, first, looking at this, this transition between Moses and Joshua. 
Moses to Joshua, Moses to Joshua, Moses to Joshua. In order to do that accurately, we have to look at what Moses means to the people of Israel. Now, when Israel met Moses, they weren't even Israel. They weren't even a people. They were enslaved. They were enslaved by the Egyptians. They were known as the Hebrew people. They weren't a mighty nation. They weren't uh, uh, the, the nation that was known as the people of God all around. They were simply slaves to Egypt. And they're praying and crying out for a deliverer. They're praying and crying out for a deliverer, but the only problem that we see is they're praying for change, they're praying for freedom, but they're not really prepared for what they're praying for. They're not prepared for what they're praying for because when Moses first comes on the scene, immediately there's opposition. Moses has this burning bush experience. He's uh, 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 raised in Egypt, he kills an Egyptian, he flees from the, the wrath of the Pharaoh, and he goes off to be a shepherd, and for 40 years in the, in the wilderness, he's, he's uh, uh, taught to, to lead sheep, pretty much, similarly to what he'll be doing when God calls him to set uh, Israel free. So God has, calls him at this burning bush experience and says, Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt and say to Pharaoh, let my people go so that they can worship me in the wilderness. Moses is like, me? You want me? You, got, you sure you got the right guy? And, and God's like, yes, yes, this is you. I, I've chosen you. Go do, go do this. So Moses takes his staff with his miracles and takes his staff and, and knows that he's called and goes and he says to Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh doesn't say, sure, why not? Take them, take them. Because they were making him money. They were making him powerful and making Egypt powerful as a nation. So he's not going to let all that go. So Pharaoh says, no, who is this God that I should obey him? This God says, let my people go. Well, I'm a God too. And I say, no. In fact, because you showed up, you, that shows that these people that are working for me are lazy. So I'm going to make them work twice as hard. I'm going to make them make straw without, I'm going to make them make bricks without straw. I'm going to make them do all these incredible, I'm going to set all these incredible demands on them. And so we see here that Israel was praying in the previous chapters for a deliverer. God hears their cry, sends Moses, Moses comes to them, and immediately they face some sort of opposition because Moses represents the change that they were praying for, but the change they were, that they were not ready for. Because often when we pray for change, we get excited because why? We have the end result in mind. When we're praying for change, we have the end result in mind, not realizing that there are steps we have to take in order for that change to fully be manifested. We're always thinking, oh, God, you know, save my, my son, save my daughter. Oh, God, you know, help me to get good grades. Oh, God, give me that, 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 uh, uh, that bonus on my job. Oh, God, help me with this and that. And we have that end result in mind. Good. Not realizing the steps that are going to have to be taken in order for that end result to be realized. It's going to cost you some things. It's going to cost some struggle. It's going to cost some pain. And some opposition is going to come up. So Israel's crying out to be freed, and Moses is taking that first step, and immediately they face some opposition. Pharaoh makes them work hard, and then we see that their perspective is shifted because immediately when, when Moses said, when, when this sentence is handed down for them to continue to work hard, they say, oh, Moses, may God judge you for what you've done to us. But you prayed for a deliverer. God raised this person up, sent him to you, but yet when things don't go your way, when opposition rises up, here you go turning on the very thing that you prayed for. So this is what we see happening here. This is the, that first initial interaction. And so now we see that uh, Moses ended up becoming the person that God would use to deliver, Egypt, to deliver Israel out of Egypt through uh, the Red Sea. The Red Sea. The, God has these ten plagues that he works through Moses. The last plague over Egypt is the death of the firstborn. At each of these plagues, Pharaoh says, no, I'm not letting him go. 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 And it's crazy things, things that, you know, if, st if stuff happened to us, we'd be like, here, take him, take him, take him. But the Pharaoh is just so hard-hearted and hard-headed and stubborn that he's not willing to let him go. But then this death of the firstborn happens, and Pharaoh loses something that's precious to him, and he realizes this is a bit more than I can handle a bit more than I can bear, so I'm going to let these people go because clearly their God wants, wants them to be free more than I want to keep them. And so at that moment, they come to the Red Sea. Moses leads them. They're singing praises to God because God is leading them out into, the, into this new territory. And they come to the Red Sea, and to their horror, they look behind them, and they see the Pharaoh chasing after them, 
chasing after them. And they say, oh my gosh, were there no graves in Egypt that you took us here to die? You brought us here to die? We need a miracle. We need a miracle. And God says, and Moses says, God, you need to show up right here, right now, like only you can show up and do what only you can do. And so God does just that. He says, Moses, stretch out your staff. Moses stretches out his staff. And at him stretching out his staff, the waves of the water part. And Israel walks through on dry ground. Like a baby being pushed out of the womb of its mother, the Lord is moving and pushing Israel out of Egypt through the Red Sea to become a nation. At that moment, right there and right then, as Israel walked through, the nation of Israel was born. It was born because everyone heard about it. Even if we read all throughout, throughout Joshua, we see nations hear that Israel is coming, and they says their knees grew weak and their hearts fainted because everyone knows, knows this is the nation that toppled Egypt. Egypt was a world power at that time. And so they're now walking through the Red Sea, and Moses is now, you know, seen as, 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 as the person that God used and their deliverer, and this nation is born. But this nation now, like a baby, has to be taught has to be nurtured, has to be instructed, has to be developed. So that's where the law comes in. The Ten Commandments comes in. And all these different things come into play to instruct the people of Israel how to honor God, how to live differently from these other nations. Like a baby, you know, they have to learn to walk. They they, they get up and then they fall, and they get up and then they fall. Then they take one step. Then they have to even learn before that to roll over. And then they have to get their, their, their tongue moving and their teeth growing in and learn to talk and all these different things that we take for granted because we do them every day. But Israel was a baby, a baby nation, a young nation, and God had to teach them how to live. Because don't forget, they were enslaved for 400 years. Enslaved, learning about new gods, about all these different things that God said, look, this should not be a part of you now. Now that you're with me, I'm going to teach you something different. So Moses was the person that would assist them in this learning process. Moses was the one that God called to assist them in this learning process. And so sometimes, unfortunately, the stress that a child brings can often turn, uh, uh, cause a parent to do something that he or she would regret, right? And so we see here that the children of Israel were very much like that, children. And so they were crying all the time, oh, were there no graves in Egypt? Oh, there's no food, Moses. Oh, there's no water, Moses. Oh, you brought us here to die, Moses. Oh, we need this and that. Why is this? They had no, little or, or no faith. And Moses is constantly dealing with this, praying to God, man falls from heaven when they need food, praying to God to give them shelter, praying to God to provide them to win their battles and win these victories and, and praying to God on their behalf. And then they get to Moses and and they cause him to do something that's, that's very disheartening. Earlier, many years before, God provided, did a miracle by providing uh, water in the wilderness. They're crying out. They're saying, Moses, uh, God, we please, we need some water. We need water. And, and God tells Moses, you strike the rock with your staff. Moses is now used and accustomed to doing miracles with his staff. God says, strike the rock with your staff and water will flow from it. And that's how the people of Israel will get their water. Moses does this, and then the water comes. It's great. Years later, years later, years later, same situation occurs. People of Israel crying out for water. God tells Moses, this time I want you to speak to the rock. Don't strike it. Speak to the rock. Out of his anger and out of his frustration... Instead of speaking to the rock, Moses strikes the rock, not once, but twice. Water still flows from this rock, but as a result, Moses is then banished from entering into the land that God promised. And this shows us a very dangerous thing, especially for leaders and those that are in positions of authority, is that God can still, and even even followers as well, but God can still use you and work through you and meet the needs of his people through you But there's a danger to realize that we don't realize there's some things in us that need addressing in spite of God's working. You see, sometimes we can go off of an old pattern in a new season. And that old pattern isn't necessarily what we need for this new season. We may think the old pattern will suffice because God did it before or this worked before. But God is calling us to something new. 
And you see, I, I was reading through, uh, studying for this, and, and I, I, I stumbled on a commentary, and it talked about how Moses was a man of miracles. His whole life was a, a, man, a man of miracles. God gave him this staff. And with this staff, he, he rose up and did great wonders for the Lord. He didn't deal with the world on its own terms. Instead, he resorted to the supernatural things to get things done. And you see, he didn't talk to bring forth the water. Instead, he struck it into submission. You see, a different type of leadership was required for the promised land. God promised them a land that was flowing with milk and honey, a land that was great and just for them. But for them, they had to realize, yes, God's going to provide for us in this wilderness, and God can provide for us in the promised land, but we have to work for it. We have to work. It's a different type of leadership now. It's not just I'm going to rely fully on these miracles. But we have to now till the, till the ground and build our homes and do all these things that require work. And so God tells Moses, I need you to speak. I need you to speak to this rock. And so what we see happening here is if you remember back to Moses' initial call, when God calls him at the, out the burning bush, what does Moses say? He says, God, you want me to, to release your people out of Egypt? But wait a minute, my, I'm, I'm, I'm slow in speech. His weakness was his speech. So what do you do when the very thing God calls you to do is, is your weakness? Do you lean on your strength or do you realize that in your weakness, he is strong? See, Moses' is, Moses is strength and what Moses realized he was good at was using his staff. But God said, no, 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 I want you to use your weakness in this time. I want you to speak to this rock, not use your default. Not use what you've always known, but try something different. Switch it up a little bit. And many of us are operating in a, in a season or operating in a place of what we've always been doing, even though God is ready to use our weakness for his glory because it's uncomfortable. We're not in a place where we can walk forward and, and, and be comfortable in our weakness so that he can get the glory. This shows us that God can still work through us. And the people still got fed. Because God is faithful, even when we're not. The people still got the water they were searching for, even though Moses disobeyed. Because God is faithful to meet the needs of his people. So even if the vessel isn't 100% there, God can still work through. God's still going to be faithful. But Moses had to pay the price. See, we need new wineskins. We need fresh anointing. We can't rely on, on last season's anointing to get us through this season. You see, there's this movie, uh, Troy. You know, I had to throw a movie in there, right? This movie, Troy, and, and, and this, this, this champion, Achilles, is a, a great fighter, a great warrior. And in Greek mythology, it's a legend that his mother dipped him into this river that gave him basically supernatural power, agility, and invincibility, but she dipped him into the river by his heel. That's where we get the term Achilles' heel, your weakness, right? And so Achilles is fighting this other warrior, Hector. And in this movie, Hector is he's fighting valiantly, and he trips over the stone. And Achilles says to him, he says, get up. Get up. I will not let a stone take away my glory. I will not let a stone take away my glory. But what about us? What are the stones in our lives that we're allowing to take away the glory of God? The stones that God is telling us to speak to that we just keep hitting because it's something that we've always done. When God wants us to change up the pattern a little bit for this new season he's trying to walk us into. But we're so accustomed to what we've been doing, we're not in a place where we can switch it up like we need to. So we see because of this, Moses was banished so-and-so. He wasn't able to make it into the promised land. And so a new person was needed, and this person is Joshua. Joshua, Moses is interceding and, and praying for uh, someone to, to come up in the ranks. And we see that Joshua was selected by Moses to uh, 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 fight um, against the Amalekites. He was selected. He was the guy that said, okay, we're going to put you in charge of this army, and you're going to take Israel out to fight against the Amalekites while we're in the wilderness. When I raise my hands, we'll win. If I keep my hands down, we'll lose. But you're the person in, in charge of, 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 of winning this fight. So Joshua was there for that. Joshua was one of the 12 spies that went in to spy out the promised land. Joshua went with Moses to go receive the Ten Commandments. He was in the, in the vicinity. Joshua was present when Moses came down from the Ten Commandments. Actually, Joshua was the one that said, Moses, I hear a sound of celebration in the camp. 
I hear something. And Moses comes down with Joshua, and they see everyone worshiping. And Moses, in his, in his anger and frustration, smashes the tablets. Joshua was there to witness that. Joshua guarded the tent of meeting as Moses met face to face with God. So Mo Joshua, we see, was experienced as a mili military strategist, but also into the intimate things of God and Moses. He was there for the process, there for the steps. And so Moses is praying, God, we need to groom up somebody. God, you need to send someone. And God is like, oh, there's someone that's there all along. His name is Joshua. So we see this in the book of, uh, of, of Numbers 27. The Lord, the Lord says to Moses, go up onto this mountain and see the land that I've given to the people of Israel. When you have seen this land, this promised land, you shall be gathered up to your people as your brother Aaron was. Basically, when you see this land, you're going to die. Because you rebelled against my word and you struck the rock instead of speaking to it. Verse 15, thus Moses spoke to the Lord saying, let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation who shall go out before them and come in before them and who shall lead them and out and bring them in the congregation of the Lord, that they may not be a sheep that have no shepherd. So the Lord says to Moses, take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man who has the, a man in whom is the spirit and take your hand on him. Make him stand before Eliezer, the priest and all the congregation, and you shall commission him in their sight. You shall invest in him with some of your authority that the congregation of Israel may obey. So he's basically saying, take Joshua and anoint him. And then after this, you go up to see the land that I've appointed you to. And there I'll call you home. And so we see here that Moses' season of leadership was to inspire and incite discipline in the lives of Israel. He was the giver of the law. He was the one that rescued them, but also he was the one through God that rescued them, but also uh, uh, put them in a place where they were learning, where they were growing. But he also uh, uh, was the one that, yeah, put them in a place where they were learning and growing. And Joshua now was supposed to inspire this courage. This courage, it's, it's this, this transition. And what this shows me is that different seasons call for different leadership. Different seasons call for different leadership. Ecclesiastes 3 says, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. So the leadership changed. And for us, our application is are we willing to pray for our leader, encourage our leader, and wish uh, your leader well and get behind your leader the vision that God has given to him or her? And something else I want to point out in, in Joshua 1 verse 6 the second point is, it says, be strong and courageous, for you shall call this people, cause this people to inherit the land that I swore their fathers to give them. You shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them, which lets us know that the people that Moses guided out from Egypt to the wilderness were not all the same people that made it from the wilderness into the promised land. So you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore their fathers to give them. We're going to take a, a look real quick at Numbers chapter 14 to see what took them out. So if you'll turn with me very quickly to Numbers 14 to see what kept them out of the promised land. It's a very intense scripture. For the sake of time, I'll just, I'll just read it. I'll start from verse uh, 1 through 4, and then I'll skip over to verse 20. So very quickly, let me just set the scene for you guys. Moses sends 12 spies. He's doing recon work, right? Call of duty, that kind of thing. He's doing recon, and he says, look, we got to scout out this area because this is the land that God's promised us, yes, but we know that it's not going to come without work. So we need to do our due diligence and research this land. So he, he sends 12 spies out into the land for 40 days. They go, they spy the land, and they come back, and out of the 12 spies, 10 of them have a bad report. And their bad report is we can't make it. We can't overcome these people. There are giants in the land. We look like grasshoppers to them. Yes, the land is everything God said it would be and more, but we can't do this. There's no way we can do it. Two out of the ten, Joshua, the one that is to succeed, Mo to succeed Moses, and Caleb say, no, 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 we can do this. Let's be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Let's make this. We can, we can conquer this promised land. We can do it. Israel listens to the negative report. And so we see here in verse 14, this is where we pick up, excuse me, chapter 14, verse 1. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. They wept that night. They wept that night. You see how defeated they were initially, right off the bat. They wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. 
The whole congregation said to them, What would that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or that we had died in this wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us to this land to fall by the sword? Our wives, our little ones will become prey. Would it not have been better for us to go back to Egypt? And then they said to one another, Let us choose a leader and let us go back to Egypt. And now let's skip over to verse 20. Excuse me, not 20, 25, 25. And it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, How long shall this wicked congregation grumble against me? I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me, and say to them, As I live, declared the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness. And of all your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward who have grumbled against me, not one shall come in to the land where I swore that I would make you dwell, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. But your little ones, whom you said would become prey, I will bring in, and they shall know the land that you have rejected. But as for you, your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness." And your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness for 40 years and shall suffer for your faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. According to the number of days which you spied out the land, 40 days, a year for each day, you shall bear your iniquity for 40 years and you shall know my displeasure. I, the Lord, have spoken. Surely I will do all this wicked, I will do to all this wicked congregation who are gathered against, against me. In this wilderness, they shall come to a full end, and there they shall die. And then afterwards, the ten uh, uh, spies that came back with a bad report, they died of a plague. And so we see here that God, number one, plays no games, and he wants you to have faith in what he says and rely on his word. Whose report shall you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. And God says, look, we can take this land. We can take this promise. But the negativity comes. The seeds of, of, of those that speak death come. Those that speak doubt come. And it, and it corrupted the entire nation. And so we see that these were a different group of people because everyone over 20 that grumbled, except Joshua and Caleb, passed on. What this shows me is that it's easy to point a finger at leadership. It's easy to point a finger at leadership, but we're all in this together. And the followers' example and the followers' actions are just as important. Because it wasn't Moses' sin that kept the people from the promised land. It was the people's sin that kept the people from the promised land. Moses' sin, yes, kept himself from the promised land. But if he hadn't sinned, perhaps he would have gotten there with this new group of people. And Jesus calls us to following, and he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Denial and following, it goes hand in hand because a part of you has to truly die in order to follow anyone but yourself. And so it's a, a great responsibility. Followership, followership or following, like leadership, is difficult. We always talk about leadership, 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 but following is just as important just as important because there's a responsibility involved and it's not just with the leader but it's the, with the one who's following you see because a follower has the 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 advantage of, of seeing behind leadership yes it's all about vision without a vision the people perish so there's leadership yes but the follower can 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 see behind and can cut gossip up before it spreads and cut off that, that doubt before it spreads and say, no, 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 we're not going to talk like this here. We're not going to speak about this like, like this here. We're going to maintain the culture that we have. We're going to maintain the, the purity that we have. We're going to maintain the mindset that we have as being a part of this place and these people. And we can cut this off right now. It stops with me. Not even me. It stops with you. As a follower, your, your advantage that you have in perspective is you can stop things before it even gets to the leader. So the leader doesn't even have to stop it because you've been at your post doing what you're supposed to be doing and cutting the gossip before it spreads, or cutting the, the lies and dissension at the root, or bringing it to the attention of the people who can directly uh, 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 deal with it and handle it. The follower can also protect the leader and see what's coming up the ranks. And the follower sees from a different perspective, and that perspective comes with responsibilities of its own. Yes, the leader has responsibility, but the follower has responsibility as well. And so 
Can you imagine with me? Everyone over 20 that grumbled and that complained and that said, God, we can't make it, and that cried and wept and said, we're not going to make it. Everyone over 20 that grumbled was judged to wander in the wilderness for 40 years and then die. So imagine being 21. You're at the prime of your life, you're chilling, you, you know, people of God about to make it to his promised land. Somebody comes with a negative word, and here you go, believing it, grumbling, and then you get your sentence handed down to you, that very sentence I just read, and you realize you have until maybe you're like 61, and then you got to drop dead somewhere along there. You got a good 40 years, right? Imagine being the last one alive. Having everybody look at you like, all right, we're waiting on you. Once, you, once you're gone, we can get moving, right? Maybe they were that eager. They were waiting for people. That if I was that guy, last one alive, I'd sleep with one eye open. I'd eat my meals by myself. I'd cook my meals by myself. I'd trust anybody. And so we see that the, 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 the kids are even looking at them like, wow, I'm here for 40 years. Why are we here? Why can't we go to the promised land? Oh, it's because we didn't believe. And we have 40 years, give or take, some left, and then at the end of that, then you guys can go, because God is serious. Or maybe they weren't even that eager to go, because think about it, this is all they knew. These kids that grew up for 40 years in the wilderness, all they knew was this wilderness, because the people that were freed from Egypt are not the same people that went into the promised land, so the followers changed, but they're still responsible to follow. So the application here is, are we willing to own up to the responsibility that we have as followers of Jesus, as followers of leaders in authority, uh, even when things change up, even when things switch up. And the third thing that changed in this season is, the, is their location, their location. And this has to do with them being in the wilderness versus being in the promised land. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, every time I think about the wilderness, it used to always be negative. Wilderness is negative, wilderness is negative, wilderness is negative. But now I see that the wilderness isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just bad because they stayed longer than they should have. You see, they were, only, they were only supposed to be there for an allotted period of time to get to know God better, and then once they did, move on to the promised land. But because of their sin, it tied them up and kept them there longer than they needed to be. You see, some, some of us have been places so long that God's calling us out of, calling us away from. But because of our sin, we get comfortable and stay. We get comfortable and relax, right? For those of you that have ever played a, a, a double dutch, um, right? A lot of the women, maybe, some of the guys, maybe. I don't know, either way. Uh, God is a God of timing. And with Double Dutch, right, what I've seen is you guys, it's all about that timing. You turn the rope, and you got you to catch it. You got to catch it. And if you jump in too soon, you get tangled up. If you jump in too late, you get tangled up. And you can get caught counting so long Sometimes you miss your opportunity and you don't move. And many of us are just like that in life. God is calling us to jump in at specific seasons, at specific times. But yet here we get caught hesitating. Here we get caught jumping in too soon at a time that we think is good. Here we get caught jumping in too late, well after God said to jump in. And what does that do? Sometimes we get tangled up in things we shouldn't even have been in because we missed that season or that window of opportunity to jump in. So we see it may have been difficult for these new people to get into this promised land because all they knew was Moses, all they knew was the wilderness, and Joshua comes and says, wait, this isn't it. There's more. There's more. There's so much more. There's a land of milk and honey that's promised to us, a land of, 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 of freedom that's promised to us. And one of the main reasons that we don't move is the same, to the same, is the same as the reason that Israel didn't move, is fear. Fear paralyzes you. It grips you and prevents you from moving forward in the way you need to. The owner of the Dallas Mavericks, Mark Cuban, said, he said, whenever there is change, whenever there is uncertainty, there is opportunity. But you see, Israel didn't see opportunity, but what they saw was fear. What they saw was, was, was chains. What they saw was them might as well die in the wilderness in their situation, not moving forward to the promise. You see, they were afraid, and that's why God caused them to lead with the fear. God led with this, be strong and courageous. He led with be strong and courageous when he was speaking to Joshua. Why? Because that speaks to their exact problem, their exact problem. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. So we need to push forward to the promise. Many of us think the promises of God are just going to come floating down from heaven on a parachute and land in our lap. 
But like I said, it takes work. We have to push to the promise. And for us, what application is, what, what comfort zone is God calling us out of in our lives, corporately? And are we willing to follow the leader that God's given us to the new location that God is leading us? And fourth and finally, we talked about the leadership change, the followers change, and the location change. But fourth is, is God is the constant. No man shall be able to be- stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. Just as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. Just as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. God is the constant here in this equation. All these other things are switching up and changing, but God is the one that says, I'm going to remain. I'm going to remain. Things may look different. Change may come as they do in transition, as it must in transition, but I'm going to remain. And as long as I am with you, there is nothing that can stand against you. As long as I am with you and holding your hand, you shall be in perfect peace if you keep your mind on me. You see, God remains the same. He is faithful. He is just. He is the same yesterday, today, forever. He is reliable, reliable so that no one can be against you. He will uphold you with his righteous right hand. Though the seasons may change, he outweighs the changes of the seasons because he is constant. And though seasons change, many things remain the same. You see, through winter, spring, summer, fall, the sun is still going to rise. Through winter, spring, summer, fall, the moon is still going to come up at night. Through winter, spring, summer, fall, in some way, shape, or form, the wind is still going to blow. Through winter, spring, summer, fall, it's still going to rain at some point. There are some constants, even though the seasons change. And God is one of those, those constants that will not move with our seasons, but he stays. And every season, God will be present, even though there is change. And God doesn't change through the seasons. He's always faithful, always good, despite what we think, despite how we feel. He's still fulfilling promises, even today. Amen? Amen. And so for us, we need to trust him. We need to trust him. We need to trust him. Corporately and individually. Because this change that's going on about the gospel tabernacle... And this change of myself and my father, and my father being the Moses that's passed the baton down, it's not the, only cha- it's not the only change that's going on in our lives. It's important for this house, yes, and this ministry, yes, but there are some individual changes in each of our lives and our seasons that God has us in, and we need to learn to trust him through each and every change and each and every season. Amen? Amen. Amen. So God bless you. Thank you. So perhaps you're here and you've heard this message and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you want to come to know him. You want to come to have a relationship with him. You want to be new in Christ. Maybe you were walking in sin and the enemy got you down. The enemy pushed you down and he's kept you down for too long and you want to come back to Jesus. Maybe you were once walking with him, but time got the best of you. Things got the best of you. You know you need to come back and you know you need to get it together. You know know that you need to get it right. If that's you and you want to come to Jesus, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if that's you. You just be honest with yourself, not even me, not even the church, just you and God. Just raise your hand if you need prayer, if you want Jesus in your life, if you are not walking with him. You know, through every season, you can have someone who is with you. The word says, though my mother and my father forsake me, the Lord will take me up. The Lord is with you through each and every season, and he can be. If you want that assurance, if you want him, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Is there anyone here that does not know Jesus and would want to know him? Wrapped himself in flesh and died so that we might live. Is there anyone here? All right, I'll ask everyone to stand. All right. So once again, you heard this message, and if you were to... Lay your head on your pillow tonight. I'm just being real. just being honest. I'm not trying to scare you. If you would lay your head on your pillow and go to sleep and pass from this life into eternity, but you're not exactly sure where you'd be and you want prayer, you don't know if you'd be with God eternally or eternally separated from him based on the lifestyle that you live, based on the choices that you make, and you just want to be sure. You want prayer. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to remain standing while everyone else takes their seat. Is there anyone here? Thank you so much, my brother. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to just take a step and come forward if that's you. Please come forward. Yes. Thank you. You Just come forward. Thank you so much for your honesty. The word says heaven rejoices. When someone comes, let us rejoice as well. Thank you for your honesty, my brother. You're not coming to me. You're not coming to the church. 
coming to Jesus and you're coming to be sure of some things. So I thank you for your honesty. I'm just going to pray with you and our altar worker will take you to the side and minister to you. Dear God, I just thank you so much, Lord. I thank you for your honesty. I thank you. You coming as well? Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dear God, I just thank you so much for these two men, God. I thank you for these warriors in your kingdom, Father. And I thank you for the lives that they lived and for the lives that they have lived and for where you've brought them from. I thank you for their honesty. I thank you for this season. I thank you for their search. I thank you for the process that you've taken them through to get them to this moment, Father. I pray, to, I pray that as they are ministered to, that you would do what only you can in their hearts. That you would turn their hearts away from sin and closer to you, Father. That you would turn them to you so that they can live a, a fruitful lives in your glory, God. So I thank you and praise you, Lord, for all that you've done and all that you're doing. We won't fail to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, for we ask you all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you. God bless you guys. Thank you. Give the Lord praise. Thank you, Lord. Today is uh, Care Sunday, and so we're going to be uh, having a quick uh, points and prayer portion. Okay, good afternoon, Bethel. We have a couple of uh, new leaders and co-leaders that we would like to bless today. And um, our first two leaders are Sister Carolyn Williams and Sister Marie Gray. Is Marie here? Okay. Oh, okay, yes, I thought I saw you. Okay, and then we have a third uh, co-leader who has been added as an additional co-leader to the Jamaica Three group, uh, Sister Claudine uh, Fortune. You can, uh, Claudine Fortune is not able to be with us today. She's funeralizing her father in Guyana. But we do have our two sisters here, uh, Sister Carolyn Williams and Sister Marie Gray. These are the two new leaders of the Bronx group. So the Bronx is in the house. Amen. All right, now our pastor is going to uh, uh, bless them um, and launch them out. They've actually already started their group, and we are encouraging people who are in northern Manhattan, if there is anyone, or in Bronx, or anywhere near north of there, to uh, join this group, and it promises to be a godly anointed group. We thank you. Pastor? All right, let us pray. Uh, dear God, we just thank you so much for these two care leaders, Carolyn and Marie. And even Sister Claudette, who couldn't be here, Father, right now, we thank you for their hearts. We thank you for their willingness to serve. We thank you for their willingness to, uh, to, to, to lead, uh, to be plugged in, and to uh, serve your, your church in this capacity, Father. I thank you for their sacrifice, for them traveling, for them opening up their homes or opening up their different uh, uh, facilities and areas, God, to, to minister to your people, God. So I pray for a special blessing, Lord, over your people, God, a special blessing over these, your leaders, Father, of the care groups, Father. I pray that you would strengthen them. I pray that as a result of this, that you would bless them, God, that you would bless them, that you would bless them, that you would give them favor, that you would give them increase, and that you would uh, open doors that no man can close as a, as a result of this. I pray that you would keep them uh, uh, in the palm of your hand and protect them uh, from the wiles of the enemy, God, as a result of them taking this step forward and leading in this, in this capacity, Lord. So we thank you, we praise you, we, we bless your name for what you're doing in care and in the lives of these uh, leaders, Father. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Thank you very much, Amen. sisters. We appreciate your work with care, and we appreciate you. We thank you. Our pastor's got a couple of words he's going to say about uh, care and small group ministry, and then we're going to move to dismissal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just really quickly, uh, my father and I have a, a, a kind of vision to get as many people as possible, everyone, it would be great to get plugged into care. Uh, it's a small, small group setting, and just making it from Sunday to Sunday isn't really going to cut it a lot of times. And so we need that community. There's so many uh, care groups available. 
go over to the BCMC, uh, ask our, our Deacon Akile. Um, there's opportunities to be plugged in and to have community um, outside of these four walls with your brothers and sisters here in Christ. It is available to you uh, if you so desire, and I strongly encourage you to uh, take a step of faith and take a step of outside of your comfort zone and engage in a, a care group if you can. Um, yeah, it's very important. Small groups are very important. Um, so that's my charge about, about care. And I'm just thankful for the ministry and leadership of Deacon Akila and Sister Daisy, and thank you for you know, just what they've been doing. Um, and very quickly, just before we close, I just have a, a praise report. Our sister Camille uh, has co contacted us, and she said the fire that we prayed for was contained. Oh, yes, it's, 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 yes, it's contained. Thank you. The fire's contained. Everything's fine. Just continue to pray for her family and, you know, the whole situation. So thank you, and God bless.